Bibles, the Gospel of St. Mark. The Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 22 through 26. My message is entitled, The Second Touch. The Second Touch. Mark, chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of the Word of God. That's what they did in the Bible. Where they would stand up when the Word of God was read, especially during the days of uh, Ezra. Um, today it's so casual. People come in, sit down, you ask the Word of God, whatever. Beloved, I don't know about you, but I don't have that kind of an attitude. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. The Bible says, And he, Jesus, cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he restored and saw clearly every man, or every man clearly. Verse 26. And he sent them away to his house, saying, This is unbelievable. Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any that are in the town. And I'll explain why that's so unusual in a moment. The second touch. Heavenly Father, we praise you, we exalt you, we magnify your holy name, O God. You are the great God of heaven and earth. And Lord, as we proclaim the word of the Lord today, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be present to open up the eyes of our understanding. Teach us the truth of the word of God, Father. I pray you anoint this preacher with feet of clay. Bring all things to my remembrance, I pray, Father, and move in the lives of your people and those who will be watching by TV. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. The story about the healing of the blind man from Bethsaida is told only in the Gospel of St. Mark. Bethsaida was a small vi uh, fishing village on the western shore of Lake Gennesaret. And beloved, it was the hometown of four of Jesus' apostles. Namely, there was uh, uh, Andrew and Peter. Of course, they were brothers, and also Philip and John. Now, Christ had preached, and he had done many miracles there at Bethsaida. At first, there was all kinds of huge crowds that followed him and thronged him, and they wanted to hear his uh, messages, and they wanted to see his miracles, hoping that he was indeed the long-awaited Messiah that Israel had been looking for. But as Jesus began to preach, and he started preaching some hard things and tough things and demanding messages to those Jews, beloved, his own countrymen, those who were the sons of Abraham, about their need to repent and believe the gospel to be saved. Imagine a Jew, a son of Abraham. No, we don't need to repent. The Gentiles need to repent, not us. We're already circumcised, and we're already children of Abraham. Jesus said, if you want to be saved, you need to repent and believe the gospel. Amen. And about their need to have to deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow him to be saved. They didn't want to hear it. And about their need to now suffer and sacrifice for him and for the kingdom of God's sake to be saved, beloved. And as Jesus taught that as we read throughout the Gospels, and especially Mark, the crowds began to dwindle and shrink down to just a few followers. And by the way, that's what's happening in these last days. God is shaking the tree. See, God's trying to find out who's real, uh, has real faith, who doesn't. I told you, you look to your left, you look to your right, because those who used to be faithful are always there, aren't going to be there. See, they're mature now. They, they know better now. No, that's called apostasy. When I mean, you start doing that, so what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying most lost their faith in him as the Messiah. Most lost their enthusiasm. They thought, here he is, in him as the Messiah. But worse yet, most lost their hope in him as the Messiah. And even though he repeatedly confirmed his words, and even though he repeatedly confirmed his messages, his credentials of the Messiah, by working many, many supernatural signs and wonders and miracles in their very midst, beloved, that they were eyewitnesses to, they saw it, with their own eyes. They heard these things with their own ears. But the fact of the matter is, nevertheless, they still rejected him as the Messiah. Bethsaida. They had no problem following him when he supernaturally healed and worked all kinds of miracles. Oh, that's easy. I'll follow him now. 
You see, beloved, they had no problem following him when he preached smooth and non-challenging things to them. And that's what people want today. They want to have their ears tickled. They do not see just how delicate your salvation really is. And how many people are making shipwreck of their faith in these last days? And they had no problem following him when he talked all about God's love, beloved. They didn't want to hear anything when he had to say about repenting. They didn't want to hear a word he had to say about, listen, if you say you really love me, you need to obey God's commandments. They didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to hear anything about having to suffer to be saved. And beloved, if you're a true Christian, you're counterculture, you will suffer for Christ's sake. Jesus says, don't marvel if the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. Remember when I preached that message? I got a, mess, I got a letter from a preacher saying, how could you say God uh, you know, the world's going to hate you. They love me. I said, well, stop preaching and see what happens. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying it sounds like many in Christendom today, doesn't it? Therefore, this is the last time, the very last time that Mark mentions the town of Bethsaida in his gospel. And consequently, these people angered the Lord Jesus Christ so much that in the other gospels they tell us that he went there no more and he even pronounced an oracle of woe and condemnation upon them. You say to me, Pastor Joel, what is an oracle of woe? Because the Bible talks about an oracle of weal and an oracle of woe. Well, let me tell you what an oracle of woe is because if you read Matthew 23, Jesus kept saying, woe unto you Pharisees, woe unto you scribes, woe unto you people. So what are you saying? What's an oracle of woe? It's a pronouncement, a prophetic pronouncement that God makes against those who reject him, and it's a curse. It means, oh, what divine judgment and condemnation awaits you. That's what an oracle of woe means. Woe unto you, what divine judgment and condemnation awaits you is what Jesus is saying. And when we look in the Gospels in Matthew chapter 11, verse 21, and in Luke chapter 10, verse 13, Jesus said this to them. Woe unto thee, Chorazin and Bethsaida! For if the mighty works I did in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they'd have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. So, beloved, Jesus pronounced a curse against that town of Bethsaida. So, beloved, what are you getting at, Pastor? This healing of the blind man that we're going to talk about today by Christ, beloved, happened on his last trip, his very last trip to the unbelieving and impenitent town of Bethsaida. But, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad the Holy Spirit had Mark write about this incident regarding the few remaining believers there who had enough faith to bring their blind friend to Jesus to be healed. Amen? Why? Because this is the only time in all of the Gospels that Jesus didn't instantaneously heal someone with his mighty first touch. When people came to Jesus before for healing, he put his hand on them one time, and boom, they instantaneously healed. But it didn't happen this time. And I'm going to explain to you why, beloved. You see, the Bible says that he touched them twice, that he touched them again to heal him. You know what that shows me? This shows me, beloved, that many believers need to be supernaturally touched again by Jesus. Amen? This shows me that many believers need to be a second touch by Jesus. This shows me that many believers need the hand of the Holy Ghost to come upon them again uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Let me tell you why. What I've seen as a pastor, what I've seen as a Christian over the years, because they've lost their inner fire for the Lord that they once had. You know, beloved, listen to me. You can be the most busy, socialized Christian there is, and that means nothing to God if you don't obey him. That means that you can do the best works there are in the world. You can do everything, but if you do not obey him, you are wasting your time. And that is a fact of Scripture. That's not Pastor Joel making this up. You hear me now. Because a lot of Christians have no problem. They like to do this, do that, do that, do that, but they don't obey God. They don't want to submit and surrender to the church or to the pastor. They don't want to do any of that. We're going to do it our way, like Frank Sinatra. Well, you do it our way. Don't listen to what the preacher says. Why, beloved? Because a lot of Christians have lost their desire for the things of God. And a lot of Christians have lost their amplifier. They hear the very voice of the living God. God says, hear what the Spirit has to say under the churches. Listen to him. Listen to what he's saying. He speaks through men. He speaks the word of God, beloved. That's how God saves and sanctifies men. 
So what people really need is the second touch by Jesus. Oh, hear me now. Listen to me now. Do you long for the second touch? I hope you do. Do you hunger and thirst for the second touch, beloved? Do you crave the second touch? I hope you do, and so don't I, beloved. Day and night, day and night, I always say, Lord, do it again. Oh, God, do it again. Do it again. Lord, fill me. Do it again. Begging God day and night, Lord, do it again. So let's look at this little story, beloved, about the healing of the blind man so we can learn how to get the second touch. Doesn't that sound good? Don't you want a second touch from God? Are you so dead? Are you so calloused? You're somebody who can't be taught. I hope you're not. The first thing we need to do is the second touch must be sought. Let me say that again. The second touch must be sought. Look what he says in verse 22. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man to him and besought him to touch him. Oh, what a blessing to have such good friends as this, beloved. Good friends like this in your life will bring you and uh, in your moral and spiritual and perhaps your physical blindness to Jesus for help and healing. Boy, I hope you all have friends like that. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, why is this so unusual, though? Because while most of the folks in the town of Bethsaida had turned away from Jesus as being the Messiah, this blind man's friends still had enough faith to seek after Christ as their Savior and Lord, and I hope that you do too. You say, well, I've already got saved. Beloved, I seek Him every day. I hope you do. The Bible says, seek ye the Lord, while He may be found. We're to do it all the time. There's more you can have of God, and there's more He can have of you. Would you say amen out there? Beloved, imagine. Amidst all the unbelief in the town of Bethsaida, amidst all of the skepticism, amidst all of the doubt and the rejection there in the town of Bethsaida, these friends of his, these people that have rejected the Messiah, these friends of his still had enough faith. And you know what? We think that he is the Savior and Lord. We're going to bring him to Jesus and see what he can do for him. How's that sound for having friends? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? They had courage. It's tough to stand alone sometimes, isn't it? People make fun of you. I remember when I started my health food store. Imagine, all the way back into the 70s, everybody laughed at me. I was probably 40 years ahead of my time, though, right? Because everybody wants to have them now. And everybody's into health right now. But you know, beloved, I learned it. Uh, well, forget it. All that to say is this right here, is that I didn't let anybody, all the naysayers that came up, say, you can't do it. You'll never make it. Blah, blah, blah. I did it because I believe that's what I was supposed to do. I'm glad that I did. It taught me a lot. You see, beloved, these friends, they saw Jesus uh, as the only hope of ever recovering their friend's sight, the only hope he ever had. So they brought him to Jesus. And I thought to myself, oh, to have, no, let me rephrase that. Oh, to be a good and faithful friend like this. Are you this kind of a friend? Are you? Are you a fair weather friend? There's so many of them today. But, but I'm asking you this. Are you that kind of a friend that will bring people to Jesus? Or are you just going to let them die in their sins? I know I ought to say something, but if I do, they're going to get mad at me. And I really want them to like me so much that I'm going to shut my mouth because the scandal of the cross is too much. It's an offense. If you really love them, you tell them what they need to hear. So you can save them. No matter how good they are, no matter how moral they may seem, they're still lost. There's no righteousness in them apart from faith in Christ who is our righteousness. Would you say amen out there? See, beloved, there's a lot of fear weather friends today. But you know what Proverbs 17, 17 says? It says, a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Boy, if you're in the Marine Corps, and you're here today like Brother Brian, and he can testify, we say, Semper Fi, always faithful. You may not even know that person, but you will be faithful to him. You won't abandon him. You'll be a friend to him. Amen? Faithful, the Bible tells us. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are faithful. They were afraid to tell you the truth. But a brother is born for adversity, meaning that a good friend loves you so much that he'll always be there for you. He'll be there for you both in the good times and the bad times. When everyone else deserts you. You make a mistake, and a lot of people say, I'm not getting near him. Well, that's not me. That's not what I'm made out of. I hope it's not what you're made out of either. You see, beloved, 
a good friend like that, a brother born for adversity, is someone you can always count on, someone you can always rely and depend on. But you say, I don't have good friends like that. Well, the question is, are you a good friend like that? Are you? Somebody calls you up, they have a need. Oh, oh man, I'm not going to. No, beloved, a good friend will go out of their way. I have, as unsaved friends right now, I have people that they've told me, Pastor or Joel, if you need a kidney, I'll give it to you. Imagine that, beloved. They're still unsaved, but yet they're still my good friends. And the Lord knows I've witnessed to them and prayed for them, and they think they're saved because they're religious, right? But I've got to tell you, I'm so glad I can have some friends that I can count on. And they're getting less and less as you get older. Because so many people that don't have any character, as I've talked about uh, today. But they're there for the good times and the bad times. Well, you say, I don't have good friends like that. Well, beloved, are you a good friend like that? In Proverbs 18, 24, it says this. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, than your own flesh and blood. And some of you here as Christians know what I'm talking about because you've met people here now in the church and they're closer to you than your own family, amen? There is a friend that sticketh. Notice it doesn't say a lot of friends. There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. A lot of people are acquaintances, but they're not, quote, quote, really friends. So that's the kind of friends I'm trying to say that this blind man had. The question is, do you have any friends like this? Friends that will stick with you through thick and thin. Friends that will stand with you through thick and thin or just let you go out there to dry. I'm not going to admit I even know that person. I'm saying friends, ladies and gentlemen, that will stay with you. Now I want you to notice two things about this blind man's friends on the point number one. Number one, they wanted to help him. Look at verse 22a. He cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him. Now that word bring is the Greek word pharaoh. Not pharaoh like in Egypt, pharaoh. F-E-R-O, pharaoh. And it means that their regular practice, their regular routine was to always carry, to always bear the blind man's burden so this blind man would survive and thrive. And the Greek literally says so he could go forward with his life. It's hard for a blind person to get around in life unless they got someone they can trust. Amen? That is, beloved, these friends of his, they took it upon themselves as his friends to take care of him and lead him around by the hand so he could get to where he needed to go in life. In other words, if Brother Tom was blind and I'm his friend, Brother Tom, stay right there. I'll be there. Hold on to my arm. Follow me. Imagine these people did it for him, his friends, all the time for him, all throughout his life. And we don't have a clue how old this man was. And that's some kind of friend that will do that for you. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, they wanted to help him out daily. They wanted to help him live. They wanted to help him find Jesus. And when I read that, immediately I thought of Galatians 6.1. The Bible says, bear ye one another's burdens so you may fulfill the law of Christ. Amen. So the question is, are you a friend who is a burden bearer like this? Or do you, uh, do you try to bring your friends to Christ? Or you just let them die in their sins? Oh, good. Have a good day. I'll see you later. And I'll say a word to them. I hope not, beloved. So number one, they wanted to help. Number two, they wanted to heal him. Look what it says in verse 22b. He says, and besought him to touch him. Now, now beloved, the... Uh, to, I was thinking as I was writing this, right? I always preach to myself as I preach to you. And I said, oh, to so look out for your best friend's interest that you'll go way out of your way to do it. Can you imagine grabbing this blind man? Come on, we're going to go see this guy. No, no, come on, come on. And kind of kicking and screaming and then bringing him to him. And so, beloved, what a strong lesson here that it teaches us upon intercession on behalf of others. That's why it's so important that we pray and we intercede. Moses was an interceder. Beloved, he was a mediator. He stood between again and again. How many times did God want to destroy, utterly destroy Israel, but if it were not for Moses, God, uh, God would have done it. Please, Lord, what are they going to say? What are they going to see back in Egypt? You took us all the way out of there to bring us out here so you could kill us? 
I can see God saying, I'm in, I'm in, I vey, all right? But you see, beloved, what a good lesson on intercession here, amen? To bear one another's burdens, to intercede for other people, to care enough to bring, bring people to Christ. And beloved, and, and to pray and to beg and to plead and to seek for Christ to help and heal them. So in support on behalf of their blind friends, beloved Walfield, the Bible says they besought him. They besought him. In other words, that Greek word means this. It means parakleo. We get the word for the Holy Spirit, what? Parakletos. The same thing, beloved. In other words, what am I saying to you? I'm saying that they now fervently implored, they entreated, they interceded and pleaded with Christ to help and heal their blind friend. They acted exactly as the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, does to you and I with God. Oh, please, Jesus, will you touch him? Please, please. Help me. And that's what the Holy Spirit does with us. He speaks unto God with moanings and groanings that cannot be uttered. In other words, that inter-Trinitarian speech between the Holy Spirit and God the Father and God the Son that you and I don't understand sometimes. But that's the paraclete, amen, who does it on our behalf. And what did they intercede and plead for, with Christ for? And what did they want from Him? And what did they need Him to do for them? Well, look at verse 22b, beloved. It says that, and besought him to touch him. Now the word touch, haptomai, is the Greek word. It means for Christ to now lay his hands on their blind friend and miraculously heal and open his eyes with his supernatural power so he could see. Now, beloved, this was a very unusual request. This was something you never did to a rabbi. Why? Because back then, beloved, no respected religious leader would ever touch or put their hands on someone who was weak, sick, or infirm, beloved. Why? Because they believed that most diseases, most illnesses were caused by sin, and they were a very curse from God. So when the rabbis prayed, or the scribes prayed, or the Pharisees prayed, they did it off in a distance without ever touching them, but not Jesus. Praise the Lord, not Jesus, beloved by touching the untouchables. I love that, don't you? Jesus healed by touching the outcasts and the unclean lepers. A leper, beloved, you weren't supposed to get near him. You were supposed to shout, unclean, unclean, get away from me. Not Jesus, come here, come over here. And put his hands on him. Can you imagine that? And Leviticus has said that when you touch the leper, you became what? But you can't do that with God, see? Jesus was God in the flesh. He's always clean. Would you say Amen. Jesus healed by uh, touching the disease and the pariahs of society and filthy, stinking sinners just like you and I. And we may never forget that. And a lot of Christians do. So with the way Jesus healed in that day was really an unconventional approach to the way uh, rabbis and physical, uh, religious leaders healed. You see, beloved, he physically laid hands on them and touched them. So when the people heard that Jesus miraculously healed by actually touching folks with his hands and conveying his supernatural power to them, beloved, they all clamored to get close enough to touch him or to be touched by him. Oh, please, Jesus, touch me, touch me. Let me grab the hem of your garment. See, people were running all over him until they heard the messages he preached. You see, beloved, the word of God can be uh, it's a two-edged sword. Uh, cutting even to the dividing and sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints of marrow to the discerner of both the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature not made manifest in his sight. For all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We have to give an account. But it's a sharp, sharp blade, isn't it? You see, beloved, but now this blind man, he needed, what he needed was a real powerful supernatural touch from God. And by the way, so don't you. And so don't I. You see, beloved, some of us need Christ to supernaturally touch us physically as with this blind man. Some of us need Christ to supernaturally touch us emotionally or perhaps psychologically here today. Maybe economically you need this touch. Some of you here probably need a, need a supernatural touch inwardly and spiritually. You say, I've been touched. Sure, beloved, you may have already been touched once before by God, but what you need now is that second touch. Would you say amen? Oh, hear me now. Don't you miss this. You listen very carefully. The second touch by God, the second unction by God, the second anointing by God does not 
come to you automatically. It what? It does not come to you automatically. It does not come to you effortlessly. It does not come to you naturally. It does not come to you randomly, beloved. The second touch, the second touch must be earnestly sought for as with the blind man's friends right here. You've got to seek for it. I hope you're doing it. Your second touch, beloved, listen to me now, must be hungered and thirsted after, as David said, as a heart panteth after the water brooks in Psalm 42, 1. David was out feeding his sheep, and all of a sudden he hears this. And he turns around and he looks, and what does he see? He sees this deer running for all he's worth, and he comes to a water brook, and he does, slams the brakes on, and what's behind him? A lion chasing him. Takes a and he's off again. See, beloved, God says that's the way you've got to seek after him. If you want that second touch, that's what you have to do. See, the second touch must be pursued. It must be pleaded for, just like a starving man is begging for food or for bread. Oh, give me something to eat. I need something. I'm getting weak and feeble right now. You see, beloved, that's why they teach you. Anybody that's been in the service or been in any kind of special forces, they teach you that when you go to see her, survival, I won't go into the whole thing. When you try, if you're ever going to escape, you need to do it as soon as you can. Why? Because one of the first things they'll do to you in prison camp is not feed you so you get what? Weak. So you can't escape. And they'll give you, barely give you uh, enough food uh, that you can get by on. We know a lot of uh, veterans have starved to death uh, because of that. But you see, beloved, what am I saying to you here? I'm saying this. Only then... Only when you pursue Christ like that will you get the second touch by Christ and be filled with his Holy Spirit. You see, his first touch is great, but his second touch, it's exceptional, beloved. It's phenomenal. It supernatural feel, supernaturally fills you up with his presence and with his power. It fills you up with his love and his longing, beloved. And you long for Christ. You long to read the Bible. You long to get near Christ. You see, as we shall see the blind man, with the blind man, Christ touched him twice. There were two stages in his healing. So the first thing we see is this here, is the second touch must be sought. It must be what? It must be sought. Number two, the second touch may be God. The second touch may be God. Look what he says in verse 23 and 24. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, man, just spit in the guy's eye. <laughs> And put his hands upon him. He asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Jesus loved and cared enough for this man, beloved, to now give him the supernatural healing that he sought. And praise the Lord that he ultimately got. Notice how Jesus responded to the faith and seeking of this blind man, beloved, and his friends bringing him to him. When we come to him like this, he also takes us by the hand. And you know what he does? He leads us aside, beloved, to where we can get the second touch. And oftentimes, it's not where you want to go. You try to avoid those places, those desolate places. But God says, I can't touch you anyplace else. And that's what it means when we say God is sovereign over our life. And where he leads, I'll follow. It sounds good when you're singing the platitudes of the song and the hymn. But do you mean it in your heart? I hope you can say amen, preacher. I do. You listen to me, beloved, that second touch you need. Some things in our life seem incurable, don't they? Some things in our life seem unbearable. And some things in our life seem impossible. But the Bible says there is nothing, not a thing, nothing that is impossible with God. Would you say amen? So, beloved, let him now take you by the hand and let him lead you so that you get this second touch, that you may get it. It can be God. But I want you to note these three truths that will help you with a second touch, touch under point number two. The first thing is Jesus isolated the man. Look what he says in verse 23a. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. You see that? Jesus took him by the hand and did what to him? He led him out of the town. Now I want you to picture this thing. Here's this blind man in Jesus. They're surrounded by a throng of people in the town of Bethsaida where most of them had rejected Christ as the Messiah. And as a result, Jesus had now also rejected and cursed them. So now Jesus separates them from the noise. He separates them from the taunts and the contempt of the unbelievers in the crowd. Why does he do that? So 
blind man wouldn't be distracted by these naysayers who mock him and try to rob him of his faith and rob him of his miracle. And beloved, we need to understand that concept because Christ has the power to do anything that he wants to do in our life. Amen? Hear me now. Before you can ever receive the second touch from Jesus, first you've got to get alone with Jesus. Did you hear what I said? You've got to get alone with Jesus. That's the principle that the Holy Spirit of the living God is showing us in this text between the lines. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, you need to go to a remote place where there's just you and Jesus and seclude yourself from the noise and the unbelief of the crowds. Uh, in, in other words, maybe it's your private prayer closet. Maybe it's a pea patch somewhere. I don't know. Maybe it's being out there in the woods. Maybe it's a desert place like Jesus used to go. Whatever it may be, beloved, why? Why do you need to seclude yourself? Why does Jesus lead him out away from the crowds? I'll tell you why. So you can hear his voice. Why, preacher? So you can sense his presence. Why, preacher? So you can feel his supernatural touch. You see, beloved, that's what the mighty men of old di men did when they needed that second touch from God. The Bible says that David fled to Mahanaim. That was his refuge all the time. When David had a problem, he'd flee to Mahanaim. The Bible says of Elijah that he fled to the mountains when he needed that second touch by God. Moses went into the wilderness. Jesus, the Bible says, went out into a desert place. So what am I saying to you? The whole, New, the whole Old Testament and the New Testament teaches us that if we want a second touch from God, we must get along with him. We must isolate ourselves from all the others. It's good when you can pray with people, but sometimes you need to be alone. Amen? So, beloved, you see, they got alone with God. These mighty men of all, they got away from the crowds, and then they got the second touch. And so will you, beloved, if you get alone with God and you seek that second touch. So Jesus isolated the man. Secondly, beloved, Jesus inspired the man. Look what he says in verse 23b and put his hand upon him, and he asked him if he saw aught. When Christ spit in this blind man's eye, beloved, this wasn't an insult. Now, it is to us. You know what I think of you? <laughs> okay. But when Christ did that, this was not an insult. Saliva at that time, and we know even to this day, beloved, I hate to say this to you, there's many times when I was in the service, if you got wounded, if you got a cut, you didn't have access to a a uh, corpsman, whatever, you use your saliva or you tinkle on your arm or your hand, you put your urine on it. Uh, but in this time, uh, they believed that saliva had tremendous medicinal properties, medicinal power to heal, especially that, can you imagine, of a healer like Jesus. So when Jesus, who claimed to be the Messiah, literally spit in his eyes, and when Jesus laid his hands on him, beloved, it was to inspire and fire up the faith in him. Why, beloved? So now that he know he was supernaturally touched by a divine person, by a divine power, believing that, that here's God, Messiah, he touched me, I will surely be healed. Oh, you think his faith was raising? I do. I believe that with all my heart. Oh, hear me now. This was stage one in this blind man's healing. Why, preacher? To raise to increase his faith in Jesus as being exactly who he said he was, the eternal son of the living God, the Messiah, the divine one who possessed all supernatural power in heaven and in earth. Would you say amen out there? Possessing power to help people and possessing power to heal people. I'm saying we all have a stage one in our moral and spiritual healing and conversion to Christ. You see, beloved, like most of the people in the town of Bethsaida, we too are blind to our own sinfulness and condemnation. We too are blind to who the Lord Jesus Christ really is. We too are blind to the spiritual power and authority he possesses. So Christ himself takes the divine initiative and he pulls us aside. The Bible says he pulls us out of this evil world system. He separates us from it. And then he spits in our eye and he touches us with his Holy Spirit to increase our faith. And then he spits in our eye and he touches us with his grace to increase our faith and with his gospel to increase our faith. You see, beloved, that's a, that's a spit in the eye. That's a touch from God. Wouldn't you say amen? And that's what he does. Praise the Lord. And then afterwards he calls us and converts us and consecrates us and heals us sinners of our unbelief and 
inwardly, we start feeling that supernatural regenerating power of his Holy Spirit in our souls. And it inspires us to trust him more. It inspires us to follow him more. And it inspires us to love and seek him more. Why? For what? For that second touch from him. For what? For that second blessing from him, that second anointing, that new, fresh anointing that will heal you of all of your moral and spiritual blindness and the problems you may have in your life. Would you say amen out there? I'm saying you need the second touch. Would you say amen? That's what you need, the second touch. A lot of you think it's all done, it's all over with, and it's not. So, beloved, what do we see? Jesus isolated the man. Jesus inspired the man. But thirdly, beloved, Jesus inquired of the man. Look what he says in verse 23c and verse 24. He says that he asked him if he saw aught, and he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After Jesus supernaturally touched the blind man, he asked him a question like he often does to us after he first puts his hand upon us. Jesus inquired of him as to the extent of this healing and seeing by giving him, as only Jesus could do, his own eye exam. Jesus said, I want you to look at my eye chart. Okay, look up. (laughs) You know, he's an optometrist. His answer reveals, this blind man's answer reveals, beloved, that he had not been born from blind or he had never said, I've seen men walking as trees and that before this he had seen men and he had seen true men. But I want you to notice what he had to do to gain even some partial sight. Beloved, verse 24 says, He looked up, anablepo, meaning to recover and receive your moral and spiritual or physical sight, you need to look up to a higher position, a higher place. Look up to a higher person, a higher power to be healed. So look up. Look up, I've told you, thy God seeth thee. Would you say amen? In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22, God says, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. And then he adds, for I am God and there is none other. Look unto me, I am God. Notice the name that he used, I am who I am. I'm God. So when Christ touches you by the supernatural power of his spirit, and his grace through the gospel and inquires of you, if you now see him as your Messiah, if you now see him as your Savior, if you now see him as your Lord God, then you need to do what this blind man did. What did he do? He looked upward, not downward. He looked upward, not backward, beloved, not inward or sideward or forward. Look up, look up, look up. Thy God seeth thee. Come on and say amen out there. He says, he sees me, that's right. What does he see? He sees your pain. What does he see, preacher? He sees your distress and your brokenness. What does he see, preacher? He sees your needs and the desires to be morally and spiritually and physically healed. So he now touches you, beloved, but you must first look up if you want that second touch. Amen? So like with the blind man, beloved, that's stage one. See, that's the first touch. He could see somewhat, but not clearly yet. He had only partial sight. His vision was still unclear. It was still distorted, and it sounds just like us after Christ first touches us. You see, when Christ first touches us, beloved, the first time, our moral and spiritual vision of him is only partial. Amen? We do not yet see him in all of his glory. We do not yet see him in all of his greatness. We do not see him yet in all of his grandeur as our Savior and Lord. You see, our moral and spiritual perception of his deity, of his majesty, is still somewhat blurred. It's unclear, just like that of this blind man. But the people in the town of Bethsaida, beloved, were totally blind regarding uh, Jesus Christ, just like many people are today, and sadly, just like many people are in the church. They've le- their Christianity is focused around their new birth. That's it. They've not gone on with Jesus, not seen his grandeur, his greatness, his glory. And that's a sad fact, isn't it? This, beloved, these people in the town of Bethsaida, they couldn't either, uh, uh, they couldn't read either the big or the small letters of these mighty messages and miracles. The high child of Scripture, they foretold uh, what the Messiah would do when he would come. For example, in Isaiah 28, uh, excuse me, 29, 18, it's said that when Messiah came, now listen, 
he'd open fears so they could hear the words of the book or God's book. And he'd open blind eyes so they could see out of obscurity and darkness. He would not only open them spiritually, but he would do a supernatural miracle and open them what? Physically, that was one of the credentials of the Messiah. Yet the people in the town of Bethsaida, many had been healed of their deafness. Many had been healed of their blindness. Yet they still, they still refused to see him for who he really was. And so this is exactly what Jesus did in the town of Bethsaida and other places, beloved. But these people were as blind as this blind man was before he got healed and saved. You see, beloved, when it came to who Jesus really was, could see nothing. And sadly, a lot of times today, a lot of people can't see anything, can they? I'm not talking just out of the church. I'm talking about within the confines of the church. You say, Pastor, you're never going to get a big crowd that way. That's not my job. See, Jesus builds his church, not Joel. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying they were spiritually blind. I'm saying they were ignorant of the Messiah's credentials. I'm saying that they were like Saul of Tarsus before he became the great apostle Paul. He was blind. And they were so hardened in their hearts and unbelief and refused to recognize Jesus or repent or honor the Lord that they missed their chance to be saved and healed like the blind man. Imagine, beloved, you've got God in the flesh in your very midst. And you've got all kinds of infirmities and diseases, yet you're still hardening your heart. Just like many do today in the church. Week after week, they listen to the preacher, and they don't get one thing out of it. I've just got to get home. You hear me now, folks like this. Folks like these people in the town of Bethsaida, they'll never either get a first or a second touch by Christ. So what have we learned so far? The second touch, number one, must be sought. Number two, the second touch may be God. Number three, the second touch is mightily wrought. Look at verse 25. It says, and after that, he put his hands upon his eyes and made him look up and is restored. And he saw every man clearly. Now, beloved, his partial healing turned into a total one. Bless God. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ always completes what he starts. He never does half of a job in our life if we're willing to pursue him. For example, Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 6, listen to what he says. He says that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He that hath begun a good work in you, past salvation and sanctification, will continue to do it, what? Present uh, uh, salvation and sanctification until the day of Jesus Christ. That is perfect salvation and sanctification in our glorification. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, now that blind man Uh, He could only partially see after Christ's first touch. His faith in the supernatural power and person of Christ started getting stronger. And what little vestige of doubt and disbelief he may have had in Christ as the Messiah began to dissipate, and it will when Christ touches you. And this is what normally happens after a person receives a first touch from Jesus. In other words, our faith begins to soar, and it begins to dispel the moral and spiritual darkness, beloved. And we start seeing the light of truth concerning who Jesus is and this power that he has. And so now the blind man wanted a second touch. Boy, if I can see partially right now and I haven't even seen anything in years, I want that second touch. Oh, beloved, do you want it? Do you want the second touch from Almighty God? Have his spirit come down upon you and fill you with his power. And fill you with his grace, I pray you say, Amen, Pastor. Count me in. You see, beloved, it will increase your faith. It will increase your zeal. It will increase your fervor and passion for Christ. And the second touch will produce and work in you a hunger and a thirst in you for Christ that you want more and more of him. And, beloved, if I can personally just use a testimony of myself. My wife and I were talking about this last night. I, this week I've been so busy, I, I, I don't even have lunch. I'm, every, every moment is taken. But you know what? I will not let anybody infringe on me seeking the Lord in the morning. I won't do it. I can't wait to read my Bible. I can't wait to search things out and read things and get closer to God. I want to know this God. How about you? 
There's much more, more, ladies and gentlemen. We need the second touch of God. So, so many people are so content with the little that they have. You see, beloved, why? Why do you want that second touch? Because your moral and spiritual sight of His divine being and lordship in your life will start getting clearer and getting brighter, and it'll get more dear to you. Now, I want you to know two things Jesus now did under point number three. Number one, He commanded the man. Look what He said in verse 25a. After that, He put His hands upon His eyes and made Him look up. Now, that word made is the Greek word poieo. And that word means that he commanded. Notice that in order for the blind man to receive the supernatural benefits and fully recover his sight from this second touch, Jesus commanded him to look up and a blepo again. That is to now lift up his drooping head and that downward look to a higher upward look so he could now be made whole and totally healed. You listen to me now. This is exactly what Jesus says to you and I who are always walking around with our head drooping, morally and spiritually, always walking around, beloved, in despair and sulking. Oh, gee, nothing will ever get right. Kicking our feet. Look up, God says. The Bible, he didn't say he asked him to look up. He commanded him. That's what the word poyeo means. It means he commanded him to look up. People think that things are so helpless and hopeless that they can't be fixed. But I'm telling you today, with Jesus, things can be fixed. But you're going to have to seek Him. You're going to have to look for Him. You're going to have to get surrender to Him and submit to Him, beloved. But if you don't want that and you want a miracle, you're not going to get it. Now, I know the goodness of God is to lead us to repentance, and a lot of us have worn that one out. God has been good and been good and been good and been good, but we still haven't repented. God says, you want that second touch, that's what you have to do. You see, like the blind man, beloved, you need to look up. Look up to what? Look up to heaven. Look up to what, preacher? Look up to him. Look up to what? Look up in hope, for there is a bomb in Gilead. There is a supernatural God who resides in the heaven, beloved. There is a great physician that can always help and heal you if it's his will to do it. So if you're ever going to get the second touch, then Jesus commands you to look up to him, to look up in faith, to look up in hope, and to look up in trust so that the second touch can be mightily wrought in you. Oh, do you crave it, that second touch. Not only did he command the man, but beloved, he cured the man. Look what he says in verse 25. And after that, he put his hands upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored. He was cured. And saw every man clearly. Boy, that's a good thing to do, see every man clearly, isn't it? Beloved, notice the supernatural power of the second touch. His blindness was now completely healed and his vision totally restored. And this formerly blind man miraculously recovered his sight. And now he could see. But listen to me now, ladies and gentlemen. The second touch always has a way of putting things in their proper perspective so you can now clearly see and discern things as they truly are. Now the blindness is gone when he touches you. Now the darkness is gone when he touches you. Now the obscurity of that situation, that decision you have to make, God has removed it from you. And like that song, I can see clearly now the rain has come, right? Now you can see clearly. See, God has touched you the second time. He's done just what he did to this blind man, beloved, and your vision has returned better than ever like the blind man was. And so, beloved, as with him, when Christ first touches you, it's good. But the second touch is gooder. I mean, far better. All right? The second touch is far greater. Because now, you know, when Christ touched me the first time, I didn't understand what happened. But now, when I beg and plead, now, when he touches me, I understand it, see? And I want it more. Oh, beloved, I'm almost like an opioid addict when I touch the grace and I touch the Spirit of God, and I want it. I want that second touch more and more and more. I'm addicted. How about you? And only God can rot that in you. It isn't because pastor's special or... I, no, beloved, I've just tried to do what God told me to do, and he did what he promised he was going to do. And he'll do it to you too, but most of you don't have enough discipline to even get out of bed. Don't have enough discipline to open your Bible. Don't have enough discipline to seek after him. And you need to do it. I, I, 
And over the years, people have asked me to write them dietary programs and exercise programs, and you know what? And I say, I, I really don't want to, because all the promises you promised me, I don't want to last two weeks, and guess what? <laughs> it doesn't. And beloved, I've done this now as your pastor for 40 years. I've got a whole thing, the, the uh, uh, protocol for so-and-so, the protocol for so-and-so, the protocol for so-and-so. You see, beloved, it's not going to be any good unless you learn how to discipline yourself. And there's no discipline without self-denial. There's none. There's no discipline without sacrifice. I mean, something along the line, you have to say, I've got to stop this. I, I, I'm going to go if you're going to say it's exercise. I know I should be exercising. I'm going to stop right now, and I'm going to put in 30 minutes no matter what. Hell or high water, that's what I'm going to do. And when, what I tell you about muscle memory? The more you do it, what is it? Be, it becomes a habit. It becomes a routine in you now, doesn't it? Right? Just like whatever you're, you're eating. You know, you shouldn't have to go on a diet. You should know what to eat and how to eat. Amen. You know your body's, God made your body wise, beloved. But what I'm saying, I'm saying there is some sort of supernatural cure and healing that takes place when you get a second touch. It might be physical. It might be mental or emotional or spiritual. It might be financial. It might be relational, beloved. But Jesus promises that when there's the second touch, something supernatural will be wrought in you. Come on and say amen. All right, well, let me wrap this up. Now, what do we learn from this story of Jesus touching the blind man twice? What is, what is it that we can take away so we can draw closer to God? We learn this, beloved. The first touch does not mean we're going to get an immediate and instantaneous healing in whatever sort we're sinking. Amen? This is where people get discouraged. I prayed for it, but it didn't happen. <laughs> Keep praying, and it will. <laughs> okay. Do you think the blind man said that's it? Oh, it didn't work. Can't be who he said he is. You see, beloved, we learned that Jesus often heals us gradually and progressively and incrementally by varying degrees till he decides when he needs to complete his work in us. Amen? And as with the blind man, it may be only partial till Jesus touches us the second time. You see, folks, remember, Jesus uses both ordinary and extraordinary means to help and heal us. Amen? He will use medicine. He will use uh, lawyers. He will use a saint. He will use your unsaved boss. But that's still the providential hand of God, the supernatural working behind the scenes. Even though you can't see it, but through faith you must trust that it's God doing it. Listen to me, beloved. We learn that Christ's first touch is to increase our faith. Stirs us up a little. But the second touch is intended to now complete it. It's to perfect our faith. Well, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, too, that Jesus is the author and the finisher, the completer of our faith. Would you say amen? So he determines the extent of his healing touch upon us. We learn that our moral and spiritual enlightenment, that our moral and spiritual maturity and faith, our moral and spiritual obedience, our moral and spiritual vision of Christ and the truth of his word, will, and ways, and of his supernatural person and power, but listen, is an ongoing process in our life. It is not an instantaneous one, and that's why you must seek and seek and seek and seek. Would you say amen out there? And we learn that blindness partially remains after the first touches with this man, beloved. But after the second touch, we start getting moral and spiritual clarity, and it grows and it develops more and more. Amen? Now listen carefully. Pay attention. Morally and spiritually grow and mature. Now listen to me now. In stages. What did I say? In stages in our faith as seen here with this blind man. Jesus ended his dim and distorted blindness with the second touch. And he'll also end yours with the second touch. Oh, what we all need, what we must all seek is a new and fresh visitation from God. Beloved, listen to me. This second touch will give you a d deeper revelation of Christ. The second touch will give you a greater anointing by Christ. The second touch will give you more of an intense encounter with Christ. I didn't understand it all when Christ first touched me, but now, beloved, I pay attention to every detail. How about you? Well, here's point number four. 
I'll close with this. I, I said that 20 minutes ago. No, I just ran out of time. The number four, the second touch must be brought. Look what he says in verse 26. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town of Bethsaida, nor tell it to any man in the town of Bethsaida. Now that's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? You see, beloved, when you receive the second touch by Christ, it's exciting. I mean, it's electrifying. I mean, beloved, it's exhilarating. And you want to tell everyone about what happened, just like this blind man wanted to do it. The whole town of Bethsaida knew that this man was blind. That, beloved, that they could publicly testify that he was blind. But you see, they had rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus said, because they rejected me, I don't want you going back there and telling them that I healed you miraculously. I don't want you going back there. Now that's amazing, isn't it? Because the blind man wanted the whole town of Bethsaida to know this, that they too could be saved, that they too could be healed, beloved. You see, when God touches you, or supernaturally touches you, beloved, I'll tell you right now, there's an enthusiasm in you, and it's infectious. Look at a new Christian, right? It's thrilling. Love it, and it's catchy, and it can spread like wildfire to others. But so now he wanted to go to the town of Bethlehem. You know what? I need to tell all these people who were mocking me and laughing at me, so they can catch on fire for Christ too. And like him, beloved, sure, we too want to bring the good news of Christ. We want to testify. We want to share the gospel with others. But there's some time when Christ says you're not going to do it. Now, if you're here today and you're not walking with the Lord, you hear me now. Don't you, don't dismiss it. You say, well, I've seen people get up and walk out a lot of times. They don't want to hear the truth. It cuts them to the quick. And I'm telling them that not to convict them so I can convict them. I'm telling them that so they can get right. (laughs) But I want you to listen to me, beloved. When you get a first and a second touch by the Lord Jesus Christ, it miraculously changes your life and your eternal destiny here and hereafter and forever. Amen? But I want you to notice Christ's twofold command here to this now healed and saved man. It was restrictive as to whom he could bring the good news to. Two things I want you to see quickly. Number one, where now to go? Look at verse 26a. He sent him away to his own house. In other words, Jesus said, go home to your immediate family and your friends and your relatives and tell them who know you best that can confirm you were blind and that now you've been healed and tell them about the good and mighty and miraculous works of the Lord. Why? So they too can have faith in me. So they too can be healed. So they too can be saved. Not like these people in Bethsaida. In other words, God is saying, I want you to have a burden for the souls of your family. Go home to your family. Tell your family. Shake them if you have to. Go home and tell your family that that man, the man from Galilee, the Nazarene who's been walking the Judean hills, he's the one that's been walking around in here. He's the one. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of the living God. Go home and tell them that. If you have any fear for the souls of your family, beloved, bring the good news to them. So he told them where now to go. But he also told them where not to go. Look what he says in verse 26b. Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. In other words, Jesus said this. Don't you go back to the town of Bethsaida and bring the good news of your healing. Don't bring it to them again. Why? Because the town of Bethsaida had already had their chance. Their second chance. Their third chance. Their tenth chance. Again. And again, like a lot of people in church, and their ears do what? They become dull of hearing. Their ears flap over. And Jesus said, they rejected me, and consequently I've rejected and judged and condemned them. Back. I don't want you to cast your pearls before swine anymore. I tried it. It doesn't work. Let them die in their sins is what Jesus is saying. You hear me now? There's an eternal danger of disbelief and obedience to God after constantly and continuously hearing the truth and still rejecting it. Oh, that's for that other person. That's for someone else. 
I'm smarter than that. God and I have a special relationship. I feel saved. I feel, beloved, are you putting your faith in feelings? Are you crazy? God warns us, even if you feel saved, you might not be. And a lot of people who feel, don't feel saved are. <laughs> but you're always to put your trust in what he wrote in his book. Because Jesus is the incarnate word, and this is the inspired word. Amen? Right from the get-go of the Bible. Today, and you're still walking in disbelief, obedience, and you've heard it, and you've heard it. In Genesis 6-3, God said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. You hear that? In other words, God has been striving with man. He may be striving with you here today. Striving with you to get a first touch. Striving with you to get a second touch. But your ears have just kind of flipped over. Well, let me close on a good note, beloved. Do you long for a second blessing by Jesus? I'm asking you, do you long for a supernatural unction and anointing by Jesus? Do you long for the second touch? You say, yes, preacher, I long for that second touch. Then, beloved, keep seeking it. Get alone with your God. Tell him your sins. Tell him what's on your heart. You don't have to have elaborate prayers. Oh, thou that citizen the most high. Tell him your heart. That's prayer. And let him do a work. Believe that he hears you. Some of you may get that second touch right here, but a lot of people would never get out of their seat. You know why? What are people going to think of me? I'm already squared away. Yeah. You know what? Elijah thought he was too, but he had a second touch. He fell on his face before God, as did David, as did the prophets, as did Isaiah. Woe unto me, for I am undone. He says, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So do you hunger for the second touch like this blind man? I hope you can say amen, preacher. You scratch me right where it itches. That's what I'm going to do. I want the second touch.